I'm Sara Naderi, and with me today is Sanjoy Dasgupta. Sanjoy is a professor of computer science at UC San Diego. He was born in Rome, went to high school in New York City, and received a BA from Harvard in 1993. He went on to receive a PhD from Berkeley in 2000. Afterwards, Sanjoy spent two years at AT&T Labs before joining UC San Diego in 2002. Sanjoy has written an algorithms textbook that is widely used in undergraduate courses around the world. His main area of research is unsupervised learning, which is a mix of artificial intelligence, statistics, and algorithms. Sanjoy, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. Nice. So let's get started and, and let's dive into your research. What is it that you do at UC San Diego? So the main thing I work on is unsupervised learning, which is how a machine can learn from the environment around it without having everything explained to it. Uh, so in most of machine learning, what happens is that the machine gets, um, for instance, images and needs to be told what each image is. For example, if a machine is learning how to identify animals, it needs to be given lots and lots of pictures of animals and needs to be told, this one's a giraffe, this one's a zebra, this one's a cow, and so on. But that's not the way humans learn. We seem to be able to passively take in the environment around us and learn with very little supervision. Once in a while, somebody tells us that's a zebra and we instantly learn the concept perfectly. Um, so that's, the, that's one of the goals of unsupervised learning, to really make use of the information in the world around us, to build a representation of this world, so that when the time comes, we can learn the things that need to be learned very efficiently in the same way that a child does. So what did you ever work on? Um, I know you're, you work on unsupervised learning, but have you worked on supervised learning to, to have a sense of appreciation of the two? Every now and then I do. Uh, supervised learning is the dominant paradigm in machine learning. It's really the thing that um, the, the field is best at, mm -hmm. in a sense. Um, is that too easy for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I've always found the unsupervised uh, part much more interesting because it's much more aligned with the way humans learn and the way humans think. And so it's a, it's a more cognitively plausible type of learning. And, uh, and, and so that's been the motivation for me all along. So you really want to make sure that you know, what you're building is as human-like as possible. Well, um, that, would be, that would be wonderful. Um, but, but, but mostly humans have served as an inspiration for what is possible. Hmm. Um, because it's sort of remarkable what a child is able to achieve in the first year or two. Um, you know, when, when, when the child is born, uh, it has the ability to adapt to any language, whatever its mother tongue happens to be, it's not pre-programmed, um, to any sort of environment. And it's just taking in the world around it, sounds, sights, smells, and adapting to this world, building a model of it. and within two years, by the end of the second year, the child is able to learn so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very impressive feat. We don't know how it's done, but it's a source of inspiration because it would be wonderful if we were able to model what's going on and to, to understand it better and perhaps to have machines do something similar. I don't know if this is relevant, but could this be helpful for ChatGPT or something like that? I think a large part of the promise is that um, these GPT systems are trained in an unsupervised way. Yeah. And so they are, in fact, able to build rich models of the world. Um, so they're clearly doing something very interesting. Yeah. It's not necessarily... Um, what a child is doing or what any other organism is doing, but it's doing something quite sophisticated and, um, and potentially very useful. Um, and we don't really understand yet, I think. Is that, uh, so when you say, if I'm understanding this correctly, they don't know entirely how it works or, or is that correct or, or not how GPT works? So 
would you say there are times when you're developing your research that you're kind of like, it's a little bit beyond you, but you're kind of going with it? Right, so um, in the case of GPT, um, so it was trained in a particular way, but I, what I would say is that people um, don't understand um, exactly how it works in the sense that um, I think just about anybody would be hard pressed to predict um, you know, its response mm. or conceivable responses to, um, to queries that, are, that it's given. So most of the work that, that I do is probably on the other end of the spectrum, relatively simple systems that um, can be understood um, quite, quite thoroughly, um, fairly simple algorithms that can then serve as building blocks for other stuff. Basically, algorithms get more and more complicated, but ultimately they're made up of relatively simple building blocks like, um, oh, here's a procedure for sorting numbers. Or, or in, in my case, in unsupervised learning, there are some basic tasks like clustering data, dividing it into groups, or uh, finding certain types of structure in data. And more complicated tasks build on those. They sort of use them as modules. And so um, uh, one of the things that I'm interested in, and many people in this area are interested in, are getting those basic modules correct. Mm are doing them in a way that is sound and robust. What does correct look like? That it's, it's actually a very tricky question. <laughs> uh, so I can give you, uh, so for example, um, one very basic thing that humans do and is, uh, and is a basic part of unsupervised learning is clustering, which is dividing things into groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so let's say for example that a business has got a large client base. Okay, um, let's say a newspaper, for example. So they've got lots and lots of clients, lots and lots of readers, and they have information on them. They are collecting information on their reading patterns. For example, if it's online, they know who reads, who's reading what. But, and so they have all this data, but how do they make sense of it? Because there's so many customers, perhaps millions of customers, and there's all this data about this person's reading that and this person's reading that. How can they sort of condense it into a form that's actually understandable, where they have some idea of what this customer base is really like. So one way to do it is to cluster them. And what that means is to take these customers and just divide them into groups that are hopefully coherent. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be very helpful because you can say that, well, although we have a million customers, it turns out that 20% of them form this very coherent group that only reads the sports section or 10% of them forms this other group that basically just does the crossword. Or, you know, 30% of them are only interested in business and politics. And in this way, you know, although they're millions of customers, they can understand them because they're saying, well, they're basically just 20 or 30 groups. Hmm. And any change that we make, we um, can then understand its effects a little bit better. You know, this group will like it and this group won't. So that's an example of clustering, where you have a large amount of data and you want to divide it into groups that are coherent or that make sense. So uh, this is very widely used. So it's used, um, you know, so I think we do it cognitively, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's a very common application of computer science and of machine learning. How does this fit into uh, the Encore uh, research that, that uh, Barna's leading? So Encore is about um, procedure for data analysis, for data science in general, and there's a focus on procedures that are efficient and that are correct in a mathematical sense. Um, so procedures that don't just work well on one or two data sets, but really are, have got some stronger guarantee than that that will always do the right thing. And that's really what we want from algorithms. They're so widely used, and um, we sort of trust the results of their analysis to some extent. So we really want it to be the case that, you know, they, that they don't do something horrible on 10% of the data we give it. So the focus of Encore is on developing algorithms for data analysis problems 
and algorithms that are mathematically sound. And one area that is in dire need that, that really needs these kinds of algorithms is unsupervised learning. Hmm. There's a shortage of very good algorithms. Or there's also a shortage of understanding exactly what the tasks are, precisely defining what tasks are we trying to solve. When we were talking about ChatGPT, you had said something about, uh, it still stuck with me, we don't know entirely or understand entirely how it works because we can't predict what it's going to say. Um, is there any worry about that? Like, are we robots and <laughs> <laughs> uh, is this a simulation? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so in terms of the robot thing, I mean, you know, there's, there's certainly, um, you know, some extent to which we can be thought of as machines. Um, you know, we go about doing various tasks. Um, uh, we are a complicated biological organism, but, um, you know, and, and it's quite possible that there are parts of us that uh, cannot be explained mechanistically, but there's plenty that can, and that's already, you know, enough food for thought. Mm -hmm. There's plenty to study there. Maybe there's other stuff. Maybe there's a soul or, you know, or, or whatever else. But there's also a lot that looks a whole lot like a machine, and um, and 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 you know that can be studied in that way um, beneficially. In terms of the GPT thing, <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. A lot of people seem very worried about it, and um, right, it's it seems so powerful and unpredictable, and there's just no telling where it's going to go but there's also no stopping it. And, um, you know, it's, it's ridiculous to ask for some company to pause research for six months. Yeah. Six months is nothing. Yeah. I thought about that, too. I just <laughs> think somebody had said, you know, who's going to stop and who's going to keep going? Who's actually going to stop? Like, if you could actually get the whole world to stop, that's one thing. But really what's going to happen is if you try to pause people, then certain people might pause and other people will still just keep going and accelerate. Right. And, and from what I'm seeing in these companies, nobody's pausing at all. Right. They're going and they're going all in. Right. They're so excited about this. It seems like it's like, um, like they're creating something that's it's more powerful than they can keep control of. Um, so is that the biggest thing that people are worried about is the negative side of developing something that kind of, can it live on its own? I don't know. Can it have a mind of its own? Can it start controlling other things? Is there, what, what is, <laughs> I'm trying to think of like the words to say, what does doomsday look like with, uh, <laughs> well, when this thing all goes bad, if it goes bad, I'm not thinking it will. I mean, there are all sorts of possible bad outcomes. Yeah. Um, but these are largely unforeseeable. But there's also lots of foreseeable outcomes that are not good, you know, like um, a lot of jobs being taken over by um, these sort of systems where they are used to, you know, um, they're already being used to draft letters, speeches, children are using them for homework. None of this sounds good. Hmm. And um, yeah, so there are some definite doomsday scenarios that could occur in the distant future, but there's plenty of bad stuff that, you know, can occur even in the near term. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna go back in time. We're gonna understand what you were like as a child. Okay. <laughs> so you were born in Rome. When did you come out to New York City? Um, I, I, I was in New York for high school, so starting in 1986. Okay. And um, I was there for three years and absolutely loved it. I was in um, a high school that specialized in math and science. Oh, nice. And it was really at that time that I got interested in these kinds of things. Um, before that, I'd just been a relatively studious kid. I was, um, you know, pretty good at all at all my subjects. I didn't really, you know, like some more than others. If, if I had to choose, I would probably say at that time I liked history, I liked French. But when I got to this particular high school, because it was, um, so this was Stuyvesant High School, which is very much a math and science 
focus school. And um, it really, it, it really sort of directed me. Um, and uh, it's especially towards math because before then I had been fairly good at math but was never interested in it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just, it was just big sheets of problems and I just had to go through them, you know, multiply this, do this and that. And it just seemed sort of rote mm -hmm. and um, not terribly interesting. But when I started this high school, um, the classes, I remember my first math class, it was just um, a lot more challenging. Hmm. And the problems were sort of interesting. And I had to think about that. It was not just pages of calculations. And um, I, I kind of liked it. And actually, my math teacher came up to me after a few weeks and said that, hey, you're not too bad at this. Why don't you come and join our math team? Hmm. And this school had a math team, a really big one, with 100 students. Wow. And so I went and joined. Uh, you know, school started at 9 a.m. This math team met at 8 a.m., so oh, wow. for one hour. Um, and, you know, we were all coming from all, all different parts of New York City, so we had to take the subway in. So, you know, we would leave home at, you know, 7 a.m. in order to get there at 8. But I remember I, I showed up the first day, and after that I went every day because I just liked it so much. And it was not, you know, it, basically we were just solving math problems. That's all, that's all we were doing. But they were like little puzzles, yeah. you know? And it's, you know, so the same way that a lot of people like doing Sudokus, you know, it's just like a little puzzle. And, you know, some people might look at it and be like, why do you want to do that? That looks like work or that looks, you know, why do you want to strain your brain in that way? But for people who like it, it's just fun. Yeah. Because it's absorbing, you know, it's a little puzzle. And you don't really think of it as work, you just kind of enjoy it. And that's what this was like. So every morning we'd meet for one hour just doing these problems. And each problem was like a little puzzle. You know, like it might be, oh, here's a sequence of numbers. What do you think is the next number in the sequence? And, you know, it could be a simple sequence like 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. We're like, oh, it's doubling each time. So now I know what the next one is. Or it could be something a little bit more complicated. Or they could give you a picture and say, here's a circle and here's a line and so on. And what's the radius of the circle? And it's a puzzle because based on the information, you just kind of have to put everything together and figure, figure that out. And so it just became, um, it, so that was my extracurricular activity. And, um, and that's really what made me fond of math because before that it had just seemed like drudgery. Yeah. I love how teachers can be so influential like that. Um, if they hadn't suggested it to you, I wonder if you would, would have found it. Um, I, I doubt that I would have. Yeah. Are there other extracurricular activities that you did other than math? So um, this was the only one that I did at school. Mm. But um, at that time, so this was the mid-80s, this was also the time when home computers were had, had sort of taken off. And um, I got my first home computer when I was 11. Mm. It was a horrible little computer. What called, was it called? Um, so it was called the Sinclair ZX81. Okay. It was made by this British entrepreneur called Sir Clive Sinclair. Hmm. Um, in the U.S., I think it was marketed as the Timex Sinclair 1000. Okay. It was, so you know how, like nowadays, when you buy a Mac, it's eight gigabytes? So that is um, eight million kilobytes. This computer is one, was one kilobyte. Wow. Okay? And it was, it's just a horrible little machine. My father had no idea what the point of this was. He was a historian, uh, you know, and my mother was uh, an English literature major. And so they didn't know about this kind of stuff. But somehow, my dad had this in inkling that I might like it. So he just picked up this thing. He didn't know what it was. And he just, you know, dumped it at home. And I started playing with it. And for some reason, I found it fascinating. You know, and it, and it was such a primitive device that you couldn't get it to do much. So I remember writing these programs where it would just print hollow. 
Yeah. And I felt a sense of satisfaction, you know? And then I made it print hollow 10 times. And then, you know, so it sounds, it sounds sort of dumb. You know, why would you want, uh, you know, this machine to say hello 10 times? But there was something just fascinating about it to be able to write a little program that did that. And I was hooked somehow. Yeah. And so this was when I was 11 and um, the computer died in no time at all oh. because it was, a, it was a very bad computer. And after that, we moved to, um, we actually moved to Tanzania after that in East Africa. And at that time, there was, you couldn't get computers or anything like that there. I mean, we had, we, we, we had, um, it was hard to, to get basic staples like rice and bread and so on. Um, and so for the two years that we were there, um, I didn't have a computer, but I was fantasizing about it. Wow. And I was finding about, out about computers that were available in other countries. So I'd get these magazines um, from these other computers. And Sir Clive Sinclair had developed a follow-up computer called the ZX Spectrum, which was much more powerful. And so I used to keep dreaming that I had one, and I used to write computer programs for it. So wow. I found out how it worked, and I write, wrote programs for it just on paper, Yeah. even though I could never run these programs. But for some reason, I found that interesting. And when we came to New York, the first thing I made my parents do was to buy me a computer straight away. And that was my main hobby at home. So when I got home from, uh, from high school, I would get home every day at 4 o'clock, and then there would be MTV, which was really big then, like the, the music videos, and then there were some TV shows, and then I would get started on my computer programming, and I just loved it. What was the language? What did it look like? Because I, I vaguely remember my brother playing on a Atari and a 286, and I remember uh, 386 and all these things. And I vaguely remember it saying like 10 go to, 20 go to. <laughs> yeah, um, right, right. That's the language, was basic. It, was it? Yeah, so that was the language. The computer itself looked like a, it, I think some people have described it as a bread box. Okay. It was a very beautiful looking computer, I thought. Yeah. And then you plugged it into the TV. Okay. And um, if you wanted to store anything, you could do it on a cassette. Um, or they, and and I, I, I got a disk drive. Um, uh, which was which was a nice upgrade, and um, and yeah, the, the the programming was basic, so it looked like that. It was like you had line numbers like line ten, print hello, and it would print hello, and line twenty, go to ten, and it looked it looked like this. Um, but anything you did in basic was very slow, mm -hmm. and so if you really wanted to write cool programs, you had to write it in machine code. Oh wow. So you had to get down to the level of um, of the of the assembler. Okay. And so and those were very very intricate programs, but it was also fun. Did you have to shift registers when you did the machine code? Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So because you couldn't just in a normal programming language, you can say something like set a to ten. Yeah. And then it creates a variable called a and sets its value to 10. In machine code, there's nothing like that. You have to say, use this particular location in memory and put the number 10 in it. Wow. So it's literally down at the level of the machine. You, know, you have to probe specific memory locations and tell it to do stuff with, with that. And so it's much more intricate but it's also more powerful, um, especially when the options are so slow. Would you say the computer, getting the computer at 11 was your first kind of like turn on moment towards the field that you're in now? I, I think that's probably true, but, but at the time, um, I never thought of computers as being a bona fide academic discipline. Mm. <laughs> you know, it was just uh, something I did at home, it was just programming a computer. It hardly seemed like a course of study you know, it seemed like something you just kind of learn on your own. You learn how to program, and that was that. And so when I got to college, I had no intention of being a computer science major. It didn't seem real to me. Um, but um, I took a few classes, and I 
I then saw that there were aspects of computer science that were pretty amazing and that were very different from these little programming things I've been doing at home. And it was more the mathematical aspects and the AI aspects. So I took this class where um, computers were presented mathematically. Hmm. And this was the Turing machine okay. that, that, that Alan Turing had come up with, a mathematical model of a computer. And that just was really mind-opening for me, that we could come up with a mathematical model that captured the computers we have today, the computers we will have 10 years from now, and in fact, any computational device that can be built using classical physics, you know, that does not require quantum mechanical principles to explain. So there's this, it's amazing that, you know, in, you know, b back in the, the middle of the last century, he came up with this model that is really so universal. Wow. And that this model can be used to establish things that computers can and cannot do, or things that they can do but would just take too long and so on. And so that part of it was very different from the things I'd been doing at home. And that really made me feel that this was a great area to go into. And the other one was AI. So I took an AI course, and this was back in 1991, yeah. when AI did not work well at all, you know? And in fact, I would say that many computer science departments kind of looked down on it. Huh. You know, it seemed like an area that was a little bit um, unprincipled. There was a bunch of, there was, they had a bunch of heuristics for doing stuff. Nothing worked too well. They had all this wishy-washy connection to cognition and so on. It didn't seem at that time like the kind of hard engineering stuff that, you know, a lot of computer science departments seem to pride themselves on. But when I took that class, I just loved it. There was something that just clicked with me. And, um, and so I decided to do my graduate work in that area. Um, and lo and behold, you know, a few decades later, that same area yeah. is perhaps a little bit more principled, but now actually works and is, you know, doing all sorts of things and hopefully not wreaking havoc. Well, thank you so much for being here. And we look forward to seeing what your research looks like and through Encore and independently. Um, so I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.